Hi everyone. Mathematics is full of surprises, isn't it? Sometimes when you try a hard problem, our strategy just doesn't fail. But it fails so utterly completely that we feel like we cannot salvage anything from it. Often, when strategies fail like this on difficult problems, it leads to beautiful mathematics. One such difficult problem is Fermat's last theorem. Over the centuries, people have come up with such varieties of, you know, crazy creative, brilliant ideas hoping for breakthroughs that I think each of those attempts deserves its own separate YouTube videos. Today, we are going to focus on one such attempt, okay? Something that an Olympiad student, for instance, can understand. And that is a theorem due to Schur. So, this is an attempt by Schur to attack Fermat's last theorem and the strategy just fails utterly. It just fails completely. So, I'm going to explain Schur's theorem to you, the motivations. I'll also explain briefly what Fermat's last theorem is and we will go through the solutions step by step. So what is the Fermat's last theorem? All civilizations of the past knew that sum of two squares can be written as a third natural number square. So for example, 3 square plus 4 square is 5 square, 5 square plus 12 square is 13 square and so on. So we knew long ago that you can write a square number as sum of two other square numbers. Fermat wondered whether the same thing is true for higher powers. Could you write a power z power n where n is bigger than 2 as sum of x power n and y power n? He conjectured that it is not possible. In fact, he just didn't conjecture. He essentially teased the whole mathematical community uh, for hundreds of years essentially by saying that, oh, I have a truly marvelous proof of this assertion, but the book I am reading in is as a margin that is too small to contain the proof okay now first of all this problem on the face of it looks like even a high schooler can understand it right obviously and here is Fermat saying hey I have a solution for this so obviously it was sent all the mathematicians into this kind of a chase where you know everybody's trying to tr prove this theorem this problem proved to be really really difficult what we're going to discuss here is an attempt that any person who even does Olympiad today would try to make. So Fermat is saying that this equation has no solution, right? So one way to prove it has no solution would be that you show that modulo some natural number, this equation has no solution. Maybe modulo a prime number because, you know, we can easily work with primes. Primes have better properties. So if you could find a prime p such that x power n plus y power n equals z power n has no solutions modulo p, then we are done, right? We would have proved the statement. Of course, for every n, we'll have to find a prime p. A simpler thing to try is what should tried is the following. Schur said, well, let me find all natural numbers n such that for some prime p, this equation has no solution. Then at least in that case, I would have proved Fermat's last theorem for all those n's, right? Well, even if you could prove that such a set is infinite, that's great progress. You would have proved Fermat's last theorem for infinitely many natural numbers n. What happened next, you won't believe. Schur's plan utterly failed. What do I mean by utterly failed? Well, essentially, Schur couldn't even find a single natural number n where this will hold. So here is Schur's theorem. What Schur proved is that for any n bigger than 2, there is always a p0 such that all primes bigger than p0, you have a solution for this equation. But this is crazy, right? Because now we start appreciating Fermat's last theorem even more. Because Fermat's last theorem is saying there are no integers x power n plus y power n equals z power n. But what Schur's theorem is saying, except finitely many primes, all the primes, for all the primes, this equation has a solution. So the strategy of going modulo something to prove there is no solution is just utterly failing here. Okay. So this video is about proving this theorem. But the heart of the video is to prove a lemma due to Schur, which uses combinatorics. Well, here are the prerequisites. It's really minimal. All you need to know is a familiarity with modular arithmetic and a theorem in modular arithmetic. And if you don't know, I'm going to explain it to you right now. There is a single residue class G. Its powers generate all the non-zero elements. Okay, that's all it's saying. Let me give you an example. Uh, for P equals 7, if you look at all the powers of 3, 3 power 0 to 3 power 5, you see you get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which are all the non-zero elements modulo 7. Okay, so all the non-zero elements modulo 7 can be written as powers of 3. Right? G is 3 in this example. So, what is Schur's lemma? Here is the statement. Before that though, let me just first of all clarify a definition. An R coloring of a set 
is basically a map chi from S2, the set 1 to 3 up to R. Schur's lemma states the following. All it's saying is that if you take R colors and you take sufficiently large numbers N, the numbers from 1 to 3 N can always be, no matter how you color it, rather, you can always find three integers X, Y, Z of the same color, so that one is the sum of the other two. At this point, I want to sort of uh, give a challenge to people who are seriously preparing for International Math Olympiads and so on. And if you think really, you're really smart, they should pause the video right now and try this problem. Because it feels to me like something like an IMO TSP problem. I, I think it's a little harder than that, but, but you know, it's worth trying. What is the strategy? We're going to prove the statement by contradiction. We're going to assume that somebody has given us an R coloring of 1 to 3 up to N. And then we're going to assume there are no three numbers satisfying this condition. That is, there are no three numbers X, Y, and Z such that X plus Y is equal to Z. Well, a correction. We're going to just restate. We're going to massage the sentence a little bit so it's easy to understand our proof. We're going to restate it as, we're going to assume there are no three numbers X, Y, and X minus Y less than or equal to n and greater than or equal to 0, such that they're of the same color, okay? Notice, if x, y, and x minus y are of the same color, then you can add x minus y and y to get x, so we are back to the same situation as x plus y equal to z. This is actually equivalent. All right, so once we make that assumption, we're going to prove at the end of the proof that n is less than er factorial. That will contradict that n is the ceiling of er factorial in the hypothesis. All right, so this is the strategy. So let's put our contradiction assumptions right up on the page. All right, so we're going to assume uh, that there are no three numbers of that sort. We are given the set of numbers 1, 2, 3, up to n. I am showing them as blobs for you. All right, let's color these blobs by some R colors. Well, R is 3 in my proof, but anyway. So let's color them by some R colors. And now we're going to show uh, that we want to move towards the direction of proving n is less than R factor. All right, the first step we're going to look at is the most frequent color that is the one color that is appearing the most okay in our case it's an example is blue right all right so let's see zero be the most frequent color now let's see what are all these numbers after all remember these all are elements of one to three of ten so these blue blobs are all actually numbers so let's list all these numbers in increasing order okay x0 is the smallest and x n1 minus 1 is the largest so there are totally n1 such numbers colored with color c0 with x0 being the smallest all right now, if the color blue or the color C0, which is the most frequent color, has N1 numbers colored that way with color blue, then notice that every color can at most be col have N1 elements in it because N1 is the most frequent, I mean, C0 is the most frequent color, right? So even yellow can have at most N1 elements, red can have at most N1 elements and so on, which means since there are R colors in total, each one having at most n1 elements, totally there can be at most r into n1 elements. So we have get a bound on n. n is at most r into n1, right? Where n1 is basically the number of elements colored blue. Great. So let's note it down. And let's remember that all these blues are x's. Okay, that's how I'll say them. All these blues are essentially x's. Now here is the real genius of this proof. Okay. What we do next is consider the following set. The set is, we look at xi minus x0 as i varies from 1 to n1 minus 1. So basically, we take the smallest number x0 and subtract it off from each of the elements x1 to uh, the last number. Now, when we do this, you cannot have any of the xi minus x0 as blue. Let's see why. Supposing one of the xi minus x0 was actually blue, then what you have is a number xi minus x0, which is blue, x0 that is blue, and xi that is blue. And all of these numbers are non-negative and are positive and are less than n. So what does that mean? It contradicts our assumption, right? That there are no three numbers of the same color, x, y, and x minus y. So because of this contradiction assumption, we realize that no element of the set A can be colored blue. Okay, so we remove, delete all the blue colors, and we only consider the remaining color. So therefore, now what we have left with is a new set labeled x, i minus x, zero. All these elements here on the screen are x, i minus x, zero and they are all colored by remaining colors, remaining R minus one colors. They're not colored by color blue, okay? All right, now we wonder, what is the most frequent color again? So let's see one, you know, the most frequent color in it, okay? Um, and let's say the numbers are all the way from Y zero to Y N two minus one. In other words, there are totally N two such numbers. We're again back to the same track. There are R minus one colors. There are each color class can have at most N two elements in it. 
So the total number of elements in A can be at most r minus 1 into n2. So therefore, n1 minus 1 is at most r minus 1 into n2. All right. So now we are back to the same trick. Again, we are going to look at all the differences, yi minus y0. Okay. So A1 is a new set created similar as A, where we look at all the differences. Notice y0 is the least element. So therefore, yi minus y0 is positive. And uh, all the elements of yi's are less than n. So yi minus y0 is uh, less than or equal to n. So we have A1, a set. And now we can ask, can any of these elements be colored yellow? Well, of course not. It's the same logic. If yi minus y0 is colored yellow, yi and y0 are already colored yellow, we are again going to contradict our assumption. The more interesting situation is, can one of them be colored blue? Well, let's see what happens if one of them was colored blue. You know that yi is of the form differences of two x's, remember? yi is where elements of a, okay? So there are, so yi is some difference of x's. y0 is also a difference of x's, of course, uh, x0 being common. Now suppose one of the elements of a1, yi minus y0 was blue. Notice yi minus y0 is essentially xk minus xk dash. Wait, do you see the problem now? xk and xk dashes were colored blue. And if xk minus xk dash is also blue, then we are back to the same situation where we have two numbers and their difference all being blue. So it contradicts the assumption on the top, right? So that can't happen again. So which means we learn that there cannot be any blue color in a1. So we have now a situation where A1 is a set with N2 elements in it, and sorry, N2 minus one elements in it, and none of them can be colored yellow or blue. So it must be colored the remaining R minus two colors, right? So they must be colored by remaining R minus two colors, and we can keep going on doing this, right? We can say, okay, again, we argue, we take the difference, N2 minus one must be less than R minus two into N3, blah, blah, blah. You can keep going on until you finally remain with NK equal to one. In other words, Finally, there must be only one color in the class. I want to say, wait a minute. On your diagram right now, on your slide right now, you have basically so many things with the same red color. Why can't that happen? The reason is, even if you have two elements, let's say Z0 and Z1 in the slide, what happens to Z1 minus Z0? What is it colored by? Again, we are going to assume Z0 is the smallest element, okay? So, if Z, can Z1 minus Z0 be red? Well, I mean, if Z0 is red, Z1 is red, and Z1 minus Z0 is red, again, we contradict our assumption, right? So it's not going to happen. This is wrong. All right. But maybe Z1 minus Z0 can be one of the earlier numbers. Maybe it can be, uh, you know, yellow, right? Why not? Well, if Z1 minus Z0, remember, Z1 is of the form some Y i, Y k minus Y0, and Z0 is also of the form some Y k dash minus Y0. So Z1 minus Z0 is, the difference of Zs basically is the difference of Ys. But y's are already colored yellow. So if z1 minus z0 is yellow, yk minus yk dash should be yellow. And we'll have three numbers, yk, yk dash, and the difference being yellow. Again, it contradicts our assumption. So we can't have that as well. Can it be blue though? So can it be blue? Well, again, we have the same problem. The difference of z's is the difference of y's, and the difference of y's is the difference of x's. And again, you'll have a situation where you have x's and difference of x's being the same color blue, which contradicts our assumption. So it cannot be blue as this, which means, if you go by this logic, you see that it cannot be any of the colors. But we have colored every every element by every number by some color, right? So that's the contradiction. So therefore, we cannot have even two elements. And therefore, we'll have nk is equal to 1. We have to stop at nk equal to 1. Okay? All right. Let's put all these inequalities together and do the algebra. So we're going to put them one by one. We end up with n being less than or equal to summation r into r minus 1 into dot 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 up to r minus k. Okay, uh, sum from k equal to 1 to r. Let's simplify that. Let's copy it again. What is r into r minus 1 into dot 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 up to r minus k plus 1? So we have this particular inequality. Now let's write the expression r into r minus 1 into r minus k plus 1 as r factorial by k factorial. And then we see that summation r factorial by k factorial is at most e r factorial. So we proved that n is less than e r factorial and that concludes our contradiction. Now we have proved Schur's lemma. Now, all that remains to be proven is Schur's theorem. Schur's theorem states that for any n greater than 2 and almost all the primes p except the first few up to p0, let's say, the equation x power n plus y power n equals z power n always has a non-zero solution. We're going to use Schur's lemma to prove the Schur's theorem. Okay, so let's prove this theorem now. For the proof, what we're going to do is we're going to assume 
that p is prime and g is a primitive root modulo p. Remember the primitive root theorem which says that there is a single residue class g whose powers generate all the elements from 1 to p. Pick an x belonging to modulo p. x is not really anything to do with the Fermat's last theorem statement. It's some number that I'm picking in the, in, I mean, some number from 1 to p modulo p. From primitive root theorem, we know it can be written as g power something capital N. Let's divide capital N by small n. Remember the small n is the exponent in Fermat's last theorem. Divide capital N by small n, let capital J, I mean some small j be the quotient and small i be the reminder. Okay. We can do this for every number x from 1 to p. Okay. Because of primitive root theorem, each of the elements x can be written as g power n, capital N, and each of these capital n's can be divided by small n, you can get a quotient and a reminder. Notice since i is a reminder, I can take small n number of values, 0 to n minus 1. So what we are going to do is we are going to do this for every element x from 1 to p and we are going to color any x. What we are going to do is we write x, we look at what the residue class i is and then we color a x by i. In this coloring, we have totally n colors and the number of elements are from 1, 2, 3 up to p. Okay, So we are basically found an n coloring of the set 1, 2, 3 up to p. If p is greater than e n factorial, then we have the following. We have basically three things of the same color, three numbers of the same color, where one is the sum of the other two. This is this follows from Schur's lemma, right? Now remember, all the three elements of p modulo p have the same color. Simply means that in the exponent, the residue class is i. Okay, it's the same essentially, and the same class I'm calling i. So we have this equation in front of us. Okay, simply from Schur's lemma. But now we can just cancel off that g power i everywhere simply because g power i is basically relatively prime to p, right? So we can actually cancel g power i everywhere and we'll get g power nj1 plus g power nj2 is congruent to g power nj3 mod p. But wait a minute, this is g power j1 whole power n plus g power j2 whole power n is congruent to g power j3 whole power n mod p, which means we have a solution x power n plus y power n is congruent to z power n mod p, okay? So we have found a non-trivial solution and this marks the end of Schur's theorem. Note, if you're wondering why xy is non-zero, only the primitive root theorem applies only to non-zero elements. Each x set can be written as g power n, uh, these are all non-zero and moreover we have assumed there are only p elements in the set from 1 to 3 to up to p, so we've never considered zero throughout, okay? So it is a non-trivial solution. So there you go, the beautiful Schur's theorem. That concludes my favorite proof of Probably all time, actually. One of the most beautiful proofs I've seen. I think this particular, uh, you know, theorem should be more well known. So if you like it, please share it with your friends. Until the next aha moment, see you. Bye.